Well, welcome to another episode of One on One with Mitchell Fawn. Joining me this week from White Snake guitarist Joel Hoekstra talking about his Dying to Live CD or the 13 Dying to Live CD. Um, good day, Joel. How you doing, Mitch? Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. You've, you've been a, a great guest and a great co-host uh, in the past, and it's always, always a pleasure to... Uh, uh, you know, promote and talk about what you're doing. And that there's just, there's so much to go over. I mean, so you've got uh, Dying to Live, you've got Trans-Siberian Orchestra, there's White Snake. Uh, busy, busy guy. Yeah, well, I, I've I've been on a good roll here, I guess. <laughs> the last, last seven or eight years or so have been uh, incredible in terms of the volume of work that I've, I've uh, been able to get. So, hey, man, it's all good. I hope to keep it rolling. So, so let me, let's just get right into the album. Um, you've calling it Joel Hoekstra's 13 and your last album was 13 acoustic songs. And on Twitter, there's a 13 in your name. What's the, uh, what's the attraction to the number 13? And of course, why was there not 13 tracks on the album? <laughs> well, it's just been a lucky number of sorts, man, really. I mean, I was born on the 13th and just seems like a lot of important life events have fallen on the 13th. And um, my joke has kind of been, think about all the free advertising I'm going to get from everybody seeing 13s on the street. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, man, it, it, no real deep meaning there. Um, I think the the project name essentially needed to happen because it, it doesn't really sound like a guitar player's solo album. I put out three solo albums years ago. You mentioned one of them uh, that they sound like guitar players' solo albums. It's all you know, tons of guitar playing on it. And this was more of the record that uh, the fans that have gotten to know me through the bands I've been with um, wanted to hear, like just straight ahead melodic hard rock. And and I always wanted to make an album like this too, but. I totally avoided the whole like three minute guitar solo or excessive wankage. And I mean, it really sort of sounds like a band, um, but the reality is I did all the writing. So I thought a project name was the the best way to go. The Joel Hoekstra's 13. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned the other album because I've listened to Undefined and the moon is falling and 13 acoustic songs. And, and they were almost sort of like jazz records in a sense. There, there were, you know, lots of instrumentation, very little in terms of, of vocal um, this is a great departure for you. Yeah, well, like I said, this is yeah, those solo albums kind of uh, were made as my career was building, and uh, I had an opportunity to have Virgil Donati play drums on my albums, which Virgil's amazing for those that haven't heard him. I mean, one of the you know, best drummers in the world, and to have him and Rick Fierro Bracci, who's one of the best bass players in the world, um, offered their services to me when I was a younger guy. I went, man, I need to make some albums with these guys. So that was Undefined and, and The Moon is Falling, I think 2000 and 2003. Mm -hmm. And then really 13 acoustic songs was just stuff that I had kind of come up with hanging out at home, playing chord melody stuff on guitar and it wasn't at all to show off my skills either really i mean it was really more of a just nice little melodic songs and then i just arranged around the acoustic stuff um with other instruments um real sparsely but that i mean i hate to use the term but it's uh, almost like an easy listening cd it's sort of right. like um you know you unwind to go to sleep or like you know wake up and have your coffee to that cd and uh like i said man i i think over the years now being a Night Ranger and Rock of Ages and Trans Siberian Orchestra, and now, of course, Whitesnake, there's so many fans that have, like, they get my solo albums and they go, oh, <laughs> this isn't what we were expecting. They right. just kind of wanted to hear just rock. And um, this is finally that album. I mean, I got a chance to do it in downtime over the last year or two. And um, man, so far, I'm getting really great feedback about it. So that's exciting. Yeah, well, I've had a chance to hear it, and it does sound great. Now, you have said publicly that a couple of years ago you were at a crossroads in your life professionally and and musically and, and you know and the whole thing and you wanted some change and so you you switched out of night ranger you went over to white snake you switched out from the sort of easy listening stuff to a an album that fans would expect from you um what exactly was going on a couple of years ago where you just had this sort of moment of of reflection where you just went wow this I'm not where I need to be and I need to change things. 
Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, I have no idea what a midlife crisis is, but <laughs> maybe it was that. I don't know. I, I just sort of I hit a point a couple of years ago where I really just wanted to. I just made a big laundry list of things that I want to start doing better in in life. So um, I think not out of design, but the album became about that that like lyrically just um, just basically all the struggles we have in life to be the person we want to be. And uh, so I, I think, uh, yeah, just to like, uh, there was not really one thing in particular, but I just kind of made a list of a bunch of things that I wanted to start doing better. Right. At, and uh, that's what the album's about. Well, I mean, were you, you were in Night Ranger at the time. Were you not comfortable in Night Ranger? Was it, was it just not challenging enough? Or when you talk about change, do you just mean, you just wanted no, change to change your sake? If, no, nah, yeah, I wouldn't say that, that that me saying that is about me wanting to leave Night Ranger. I mean, I was happy playing with Night Ranger and, and had a great time playing with those guys. I cherished the time. I think it's more about um, like day, just day-to-day self-improvement stuff than it is looking at that. Like It's not really about me saying, well, I need a new band. And that whole thing to begin with had much more to, me, much more to do with me wanting to join Whitesnake than wanting to leave Night Ranger. Okay, fair enough. And so now two years later, or a couple of years later, how is that list coming along? Have you sort of checked yeah, off a good. bunch of stuff? <laughs> yeah, good. I just kind of started setting realistic goals for myself and then upping them a little bit every month. And uh, and I'm still, yeah, still kind of on that path. And I think a lot of that stuff has clicked and has worked out for me. So yeah, thank you very much. I, I, it's difficult, right, to, I think, to change our mental patterns. and uh, It is. It to uh, yeah, to actually get ourselves on long term um, commitments and stuff, but uh, yeah, it's it's going well. I I feel like I'm in a much better place. place. Uh, I'm curious to know though, what was on the list? I mean, was it like you know, eat an apple a day, take a yoga class, or it, it's a lot of stuff like that? Yeah, okay. I mean, it's just just about like improving all the things that I necessarily wasn't happy with, and. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, yeah, I think a lot of it just comes down to the fact I'm a, I'm a father now too. My son is three years old, so I think I just wanted to um, set a good example for him in terms of everything that I was doing. So uh, I think, yeah, I just I, I can't really say like one thing, but uh, like I said, I think it was is just about improving all my relationships and um, my spiritual life and my my um, physical well being, just stuff like that, you know. Uh, you mentioned that you that you have a, a son. Um, being on the road as much as you are, how do you deal with that? Do, do you have him come out on the road, or is it just one of those thank God for FaceTime and Skype, or, or how do you deal with with that? Well, it depends on the scenario. It's, it's every situation is different. Uh, you know, on the the last run I just had with White Snake, we just did three months in North America. Um, I believe I saw you at the the uh, Toronto show. Thanks for making that uh, road trip out to see us. Yeah, that was a, a seven hour trip <laughs> to drive out, and and uh, you know we showed up with the the guys from the from the band the Killer Dwarves, and I gotta say that was an incredibly incredibly fantastic show, and it's one of those casino shows. It was a casino rama, and those are notoriously difficult because half the fans are just people with comped tickets. They're not necessarily fans of the band, so it's a little harder sometimes to get them yeah. up and moving. And <clears throat> wow, the band just sounded great. I mean, it's just fantastic, fantastic band. Um, Thanks, man. Yeah, we had a real, I think, a fantastic opening run. Uh, yeah. It exceeded my expectations. Um, David was singing great, and um, the band was... I feel like happy on stage and off, and that has a lot to do with it, I think. Um, but what a great lineup to get a chance to to tour with. I mean, Tommy Aldridge on drums and to um, get a chance to be in a guitar team with Red Beach is is really great fun for me. You know, when you get in a team like that, uh, talk to me a little bit about how you, I mean, because you obviously you have to know each and everyone's quirks and how they play and how they start and stop songs and uh, was it a very easy adjustment with Reb, or is that just months of hard work that just pays yeah, off? I, it was. I I think that things are always a work in progress. So who knows where it will will all head in terms of chemistry? But I think I, I was familiar with Reb, and we knew each other because he actually trained me to fill in for him in Night Ranger. 
<laughs> I wow. mean, he was the guy holding down the Night Ranger position um, that I took for like a year or so. Um, and so when I when it came time for me to first play with Night Ranger to audition, I was filling in for Reb. So we met back then, seven or eight years ago, albeit by phone. But I, we've every time we've connected over the years, um, we've had something to talk about and had something in common. So um, I felt like I knew Reb coming in, which is a good thing. It wasn't like coming into a, a band of complete strangers. It was nice to have one guy that I had a little bit of history with. And um, yeah, I think chemistry with other uh, musicians and and of course other guitar players, it's all it all is what it is. I, I, um, with Reb, we share a lot of common technical ground, so it's really fun when I give him ideas. He can play a lot of my ideas, um, so that's really great. And he's a um, really great rhythm player. Everybody knows Reb is a great lead player, but it's really fun locking with him on this White Snake stuff because these are such. I mean, these are awesome riffs, man, to uh, get a chance to play live. And being able to lock with Reb on that stuff has been really, really cool for me. And so I think everybody has their own dynamic, but we, we're doing great together. I mean, I, I love being in a guitar team with him. I think he's a really great guy and a, and a great player. So, um, you know, I, I think everybody's objective right now is just to keep the band firing on all cylinders because we feel like we were in North America. Oh, you de definitely – on the show I saw you definitely were. Now, I do want to get back to Dying to Live, but since you mentioned White Snake, let me just head down that road a little bit. Um, so you're out with Night Ranger, and somewhere, somehow, you hear that White Snake is looking for a guitarist. Walk me through that process. Do you get an email? Do you get a phone call? Does, does David come out to Rock of Ages in New York and say, hey, who's that guy? I mean, how, how did you land the gig initially? Uh... Well, I, it's, I guess, kind of a long story. I don't know. I was, I was texting with Doug Aldrich, actually, the night before it kind of came out online that he left. Um, so that, that was random. We didn't talk about that. We always talk about our kids. Um, so we were just kind of going back and forth about that. And he said, hey, there's some news coming. And I said, thought, well, that's probably something to do with the band. But I didn't really – I mean, I was kind of stunned, actually, that he, he left the band. And um, – he just seemed to be, you know, the guy for years to come. And uh, I, I woke up the next day to see suggestions on, like, my Twitter feed. Wouldn't Joel Hoekstra be a good replacement? And I was like, a replacement for what? Like, uh, so I sort of traced it down, and and I learned that Doug left Whitesnake. And so I, I put out some feelers. I thought, it's not often you hear of a gig that you, you think you'd be a good fit for, and that would make sense in terms of um, – just building a career and moving down the the road further. And I just put out some feelers and I didn't, didn't hear anything back at first. It was crickets and echoes <laughs> and, uh, on the other end. And that I think some well-respected people were mentioning me to David and recommending me to David. And that, that sort of finally got his attention. And he, he did, did a lot of research on me on YouTube and uh, that just led to us meeting at the end of May in 2014. Yeah, th thank God for YouTube, by the way. Um, so, so you get there. Now, is there an audition process where you have to learn 15 songs and he says, okay, and were you up against anybody else? Or was it like, we'll try Joel, and if this doesn't fail, if this doesn't work, we'll go try somebody else? I mean, was it a competitive? Yeah, I, I, think there were, I think there were lots of guys interested. I, okay. I know that lots of people had sent in you know, their, their links and videos and things. But David does a lot of research on people. I mean, I think he just watched like <laughs> everything that literally was available of me on YouTube and talked to a bunch of people before he had me out. And, uh, my audition was basically coming out and, um, they put up the pre-production of Lady Double Dealer for what became the Purple album right? and had me take a stab at soloing on it. And I did good with that and, or did well with that. And, then I sort of compile, like put together the harmony solo that follows shortly thereafter. And, and really what you hear on the Purple album is what I played on my audition. That was kind of my first instincts. And so I, that, that went well. And then we did some singing on the, what became Sail Away, the acoustic version of that on the Purple album. I think they just you know wanted to make sure I could sing background vocals and 
that went well and I was offered the gig. So I think a lot of it was just making sure that I had the right personality. Um, we were going to get along on a personal level, which we do. And David's great. And uh, that was really it. I, it wasn't like extensive. Reb did have me learn bad boys that <laughs> for, for us to play together. And, uh, but I, we didn't even end up doing that. It was just the working on the purple album stuff. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the purple album. It is of course a cover of some of the greatest deep purple songs that, that Dave was a part of. Um, was that a good opening first album for you to play on just in a sense that you didn't have to come up with all kinds of guitar parts. You sort of just had to take the bones of what were the deep purple songs and just sort of build on top of that. Was, was that sort of comfortable to do? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it was a, it's a little bit of each. I, you're right in that it was a good one to start with, but it also was a challenge, I think, a lot more than people realize for me coming in because we weren't going to lean as heavily on the keyboards with this. We were going to focus on more of a two-guitar attack. And, and the thing is, is on those the original versions of those songs, there's really only one guitar part. So it was like, okay... I guess I either need to just double what Reb is doing in a lot of this or come up with alternate parts and treat it like it were a two guitar band and what, what would be your part. And so I, I got a lot more uh, of a workout creatively than people would realize, I think, just in terms of coming up with second guitar parts and trying to find different textures and things like that that would work on the album. And of course, we did our own thing with guitar solos, so that was his own thing. And and David really turned over "Sail Away" and "Soldier of Fortune" for the acoustic arrangements uh, from me. So um, I got quite a bit of work in on it. I feel like all the things like um, the tapping intro to "Lay Down, Stay Down," the psychedelic setup, and um, the talk box on the Gypsy, and um, playing Ebo on Holy Man and Slide on Holy Man, and the little um, acoustic piece on the end of that that resolves it. And there's all these things that I I looked for avenues to work in little creative hooks and things in the clear that would put uh, a, a brand new creative stamp on it to a degree. And, and it must be scary as well because for some reason, if you well, I don't want to say. Um... How do I want to phrase this? You're, you know that you're going to be compared to these tracks that have been in people's hearts for like 40 years. So if it doesn't sound the way it's supposed to, it's going to be, oh, who is this guy? What, what's he doing to this? I mean, there must have been some of that fear too, right? <laughs> well, that, welcome to my entire career, Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, yeah, exactly. Which I guess is the same thing with the the, the, the Night Ranger stuff too, right? It's every, everything I've been doing, man, honestly, in stepping in and having to replace essentially Jeff Watson. I mean, I replaced Reb, but everybody really knows Jeff Watson is the, you know, the uh, original guitar player. So that and, and um, replacing Alex Skolnick and Trans Siberian Orchestra, and uh, obviously now joining White Snake with this, old, you know, huge list of amazing guitar players that have been in this band. So yeah, I'm <laughs> my my entire existence is who the who the f is this guy? But it's all good, man. I I I that doesn't offend me at all. Uh, right. I'm more about if somebody insulted my uh, actual skill level, it would hurt me. I think the more than that. Um, you know, I just I just go about working hard and trying to do the best I can. And in terms of um, fame and popularity and all that stuff, that's not necessarily always the the true barometer of right. um, what type of person or musician somebody is. So, and that's where where Dying to Live is an important release for you because here you get to be yourself for a change. You, you get to you know, spread your wings the way Joel would want to spread his wings. So, so talk to me about that, about the freedom to, to do what you wanted to do. I mean, did you feel any pressure to stay inside a box and say, oh, my fans, they, they want this Night Ranger sound or they want this White Snake sound or is just this Joel being Joel? There wasn't a, well, it's a, again, it's a little bit of each. I didn't feel any pressure from the fans to do any of that, but I did really kind of try and keep it from getting too diverse. And I tried to keep it um, material that made sense for the personnel that were going to be on it, the musicians right. that helped me out. Obviously, I'm sure we'll get to that. It's an amazing lineup on the album. Uh, but much of the style of the material 
had to do with that. Of course, it's a melodic hard rock album. I didn't want all of a sudden go to like a a jazz ballad or a <laughs> right. or a progressive instrumental piece in the middle of it. I just wanted a good solid melodic hard rock record and uh as I said it's diverse. I describe it as Dioish at its heaviest and Foreignerish at its lightest. And uh if that's very much in my wheelhouse from when I was a kid. That's really what got me started on guitar is that style we're talking about. So uh, it's very much an album of coming full circle for me. But in terms of the writing on there, um, yeah, a lot of it had to do with personnel. I don't think I would have written those same songs if I was, for instance, writing a Whitesnake album with David, you know? Yeah. yeah well, you, you mentioned the personnel. So, so let's get right to it then. Uh, Tony Franklin, The Firm, Blue Murder, Vinnie Apice, Black Sabbath, Dio, uh, you know, Kill Devil Hill, Russell Allen, Jeff Scott Soto. Um, that is an incredibly talented band. First of all, is that a band that you think you might want to be able to take on the road and go play a few shows? Well, my answer to that is I'm just going to, number one, get the album out and see what kind of reception there is to it. That's the that's the first hurdle, is making sure that people will give this album a shot. Um, right. I'm getting a lot of great feedback about it, but I think the trick is getting people to listen. And then, of course, I'm willing to support it in any way, shape, and form. So I, if, if there's the demand, then I'm certainly going to try and give the supply. <laughs> supply the supply. Right. Uh, I, I would love to get out and obviously um, gig behind it. We'll just have to see what, what scenario makes the most sense. Do you think that that the has it, have the guys indicated that they would go on tour or do a few shows if an opportunity presents itself? I think everybody's positive and feeling good about the record, and I think a lot of it is just going to come down to people's schedules and how well the album does. Quite frankly, uh, I think if it gets a lot of hype and a lot of, like I said, if it, it can put us in a situation where people would want to do the gig, um, I think to go out and just try to blaze a trail. <laughs> from the bottom up with this group of established musicians is probably not the most realistic thing. But if the album is well received and um it gets gets good support and there's some type of scenario where it would it would fit for people. Um I I, th I mean I don't see uh, doing any kind of really seriously long stretches, but I would love to possibly try and book a stretch or two with it, sure. That'd be great. Now, there's a song on there called What We Believe, and uh, there's a female vocalist, Chloe Lowry, from uh, Trans-Siberian Orchestra that sings on it. Absolutely beautiful song. Uh, great, great voice. You'll be out with her, I guess, this uh, fall and winter with a TSO? Well, I mean, the way it's shaping up right now is I have White Snake. Uh, going to Japan and to Europe, and of course finishing with the um, run with Def Leppard in Ireland and the UK. So, oh, right, right, right. Um, I'm either basically. I mean, I don't really. I never wanted to make any type of permanent statement on that as of yet because an act of God can change these things. I mean, that's certainly happened in times past. So um, my view has always been, don't ever say you're definitively not doing something until you're definitively not doing something. So. Uh, but it looks like I'll be with Whitesnake during that time and okay. probably, um, you know, beg TSO that it be viewed as a year off and, and be welcomed back into the fold and in uh, future tours. But uh, only time will tell how that will all unfold. You know, it's um, uh, very much about, for me, taking situations like that and just trying to be uh, productive and make the best decisions I can on a day-to-day -day basis rather than freak out too much about the... <laughs> Right. You know, this long term thing. All right. Well, well, then let's let me let me go right back to White Snake for a second. They have this tour going on that you know Europe and and Japan. Uh, what are the plans for the band? Is there a new album in the making? Well, I'm going to let David fill everybody in on specifics, but I can tell you there's a couple different and maybe even more than a couple. But he has he's got recording projects. Um, in mind where the wheels are ready in motion. Actually, I'm talking to you right now from uh, the studio from Hook City in Reno where I've been out here working with David the last uh, four or five days. So um, I I'll let him fill everybody in on specifics and things like that. I can't go too far. But I can tell you David's really enthused about this lineup of Whitesnake and, and – um, I think just he's looking to have a really, really active next year or two. Um, 
I think not just the tour in November or October into December here that's coming up, but I think there's there's probably going to be some touring in 2016. Again, I don't want to go too far with um, talking about it all, but I think he's got plans. Um, and then and, and having a couple different recording projects, it looks like, you know, I'm going to be really busy. Oh, good. So first of all, anytime you say David Coverdale has got touring plans, <laughs> I get, I get excited just because, you know, I, I've seen the band easily a dozen times over the years and they, they're just one of those bands that just don't disappoint live. They just bring it all the time. And so, you know, I, more more Coverdale and more White Snake touring is always a good thing, and hopefully, hopefully, we can get you to Heavy Montreal in 2016. That's that's always a a goal of mine to get bands I like to play on that festival. Not that I yeah, have that would be awesome. I would love to get up there. Um, uh, yeah, I'm I'm very excited. One of the great things about joining White Snake that was very appealing to me is that. It's definitely more of an international scenario. There's more getting around the world with it. And um, Night Ranger is fantastic with the work level. There was lots of U.S. stuff. And um, same with really TSO, obviously, has been all U.S. for me. And Rock of Ages was only back at home in New York. Um, so for me, it's really a great opportunity to get around to some of these places and, and play for some new people and hopefully make some new fans. And if not, just enjoy the whole process of uh, getting paid to play guitar around the world, man. What's wrong with that, right? Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that. Uh, there, there are some bands that really seem to be state-bound. You look at Journey, you look at REO Speedwagon, you look at, uh, like you said, Night Ranger. Uh, it's odd that they sort of never cross the border. So it must be more exciting for you to actually now get to play Japan and get to play England and stuff like that. that that's also a sort of a life lifestyle change for you, I would imagine. Yeah, I think so. I, I think that the, it, yeah, every band has their own philosophy, I'm sure in terms of how they want to tour and, and the way they want to break it up. But uh, yeah, this, this is appealing to me to get a chance to go and play some long stretches and, and, go to some different places and it sounds it sounds like great fun to me sounds like you're sharpening a pencil there in the background <laughs> sorry i'm opening a blind in the uh, <laughs> i'm feeling i i'm i have myself pulled away here and i just feel like i'm sitting in like this dark cell so my, there you go i just wanted to get a little light in there you go all of a sudden it sounded like uh there was some whittling or something going on. <laughs> um, I, I want to ask you uh, quickly about the uh, Amy Lee album, Aftermath, that you played on. Um, she's another great, great talent. Uh, what was that, uh, you know, what was that like to be on that album? And, and do you think we'll hear more from Amy Lee in the, in the near future? I really don't know. She, she's really a cool person really nice. I, she basically called me in. I, I think really her string player, Dave Egger, mm -hmm. who I'd had play on my acoustic album, was the guy to recommend me to play on this track. They just needed some guitars done at the last minute on one song for what was uh, a score for a film. Right. And she ended up releasing it also as a solo album. So yeah, sort of by default, I got on Amy Lee's solo album playing on a track. But she was really cool in the session, um, and we've emailed a handful of times. She's a really uh, cool person. I think she's very grounded and very talented, and um, we got on great. I, I really have no idea in terms of uh, her future, what she's planning on doing. And of course, you've got Dave playing on your album, Dying to Live. Yeah, exactly. He's on um, What We Believe as well. That's the, the big epic closer, right? <laughs> two, two lead singers, you get the cello player on there. and Yeah, yeah. Oh, I do want to ask you about the two lead singers, and, and then you know we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up shortly. But uh, you've got Jeff Scott Soto and Russell Allen. Um, you, you, you talked about picking the songs to fit the voice. Was it really just sort of a, a gut feeling that, you know, you go, okay, uh, say goodbye to the sun is this guy. Or did you have them both record a version? How was that? How did you suss all of that out? No, it just all kind of came. Uh, it, it just um, basically came as it went. Uh, Russell was, he sang on the first half of the album, basically. I had, and very different because I had created just riffs and had Vinny and Tony play on them coming to Russell. 
because I thought I'll find a singer to co-write these songs with and have a writing partner and make it a little more like a, a band thing than it turned out being. And uh, Russell is just, he's really busy. He's in Adrenaline Mob and in Symphony X and, and also does the Trans-Siberian Orchestra tour. So I just realized, like, I'm like, well, if I want this done <laughs> in the next five years, I should probably just go ahead and write it all. And so I, I did that and Jeff basically came in and sang backgrounds on the stuff that Russell had sang to as a favor to me. I mean, he was totally overqualified for something like that, but we had written and I'd played on some of his stuff in the past. So he basically did as a favor to me. And as it became clear that this was going to be more of a project and I, I really just thought, Hey man, I'd really love to have you sing lead on this too. And have, really for me, that just adds more fun to the party. Uh, to have two of the best singers in rock today singing on your album is not such a bad thing, right? Um, so basically what I did then at that point is I had a collection of the next half of songs and I went with the ones that were most right for Jeff. So if that makes sense. Yeah, the mo the, sort of the more melodic ones, if you want. Yeah, I think definitely there's a couple of the more AOR-ish songs that Jeff sang on there, uh, Until I Left You, which people can check out the video online for. Uh, I, that song suits Jeff much more than it would have suited Russell, in my opinion. And um, same with the song Start Again. Yeah. And, and then there's songs, the really, really heavy ones that Russell sang on there, like Say Goodbye to the Sun You Mentioned and Dying to Live, that are probably more suited for Russell. And and none of them were suited for your voice. You didn't you didn't want to step up and and give it a, a lead. Well, I think that if I were to sing an album, it would have to come from more of a. Uh, I don't know. I have a real kind of heavy uh, voice, uh, screaming type voice. <laughs> I, I put it this way: it would have been a B minus, and I I wanted an A plus. I I mean, I'm an okay singer. I'm not I'm not bad, but I'm not I'm not great either. So I, I just wanted a great album. And at the end of the day, for me, I feel like the fact that I did all the writing, the words and the vocal melodies and did all the producing and, and played all the guitars, that's enough. <laughs> I mean, I feel like I feel very much like this is my album. So, yeah. And it's a, it's, it's a great sounding album. Now, is Dying to Live the first album of many to come or was this sort of i've had this in me for 40 years i've got it out thank you very much i'm going back to white snake that's it well i obviously this is not uh, not going to conflict with white snake at all white snake could obviously be top priority no, no that, that's not what i meant i mean yeah. I, I meant in the sense that you've done these songs and now it's you you've unburdened yourself from having to make new music or do you want to make other solo albums going down the road i like to i like to be productive all okay. the time i like to be productive it's a daily philosophy for me to to be that way um and always moving forward and improving in um every area if i can right. so it's on that list that you check I off mean, every morning I would love to see this do the dream scenario would be that I get this out on the road a bit. The album is really well received. And then uh, I could potentially say to everybody, what if we all wrote the next one together and tried to make it more of a band thing um, more than um, a, just my project, which I think would be very interesting. I mean, certainly the sky would be the limit. I mean, that, again, that's the dream scenario. I'm not saying that that's going to unfold that way, but that would be awesome. Yeah. Well, I certainly wish that it would unfold that way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody everybody wants that. The hard thing is that nobody buys albums right now. Musicians can't make money. So everybody's off doing whatever they need to do to make money. And the fans are frustrated saying, how come you're, you don't do that? How come you don't tour that? It's like, well, everybody's busy trying to make a living. And there's just not enough people um, to, I guess, support something new a lot of times. So... It just is what it is. You get an opportunity to make an album. Uh, I, the nice thing is that I don't have to feel like I'm selling this like a band and, right. and trying to say like, oh, I've, I've got pressure to take this out. It's really up to me to, to drive it and see where I can take it. But, um, I, yeah, but I can understand the frustration because, you know, a new project is exceptionally difficult to get off the ground. And then you go to, you know, you play a bar in whatever, Michigan, and they come up to you and say, but you didn't play any White Snake tonight. How come? And you go, well, yeah, but it's not a White Snake show. It's it's, huh. it's a Dying to Live tour. 
I mean, honestly, Mitch, for me, I'm I'm happy to just be playing guitar for a living, man. And that's about where it ends for me. I mean, so if if people get to know me through this and that gives me more opportunities to be able to do that and get through my life being a, a professional musician, then cool, man. I mean, that's that's good enough. Yeah, it's, really I think it's it's really the expectations would be incredibly high to go, hey, you put this album out now, let's turn it into a you know world tour. I, I never set out to do a quote unquote super band album. I really didn't. It just kind of one by one uh, fell into place. And and that was really everybody I asked was sort of my the first person I asked. And they all said yes. And all of a sudden I went, holy crap, I've got this amazing line of musicians on this thing. But uh, it wasn't that wasn't my intent. I'm yeah. setting out on it. Well, well it, it certainly panned out. I mean, when, when you have the guy who was in Sabbath and Dio said, yeah, I'll play drums for you, you go, oh, okay, it's not a bad deal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I owe that to Tony Franklin because I think they have a relationship. And I had asked Tony first because we did the VHF project together, which is totally different. That's like instrumental psychedelic rock. And I said to Tony, I'm gonna, I want to go straight into this vocal rock project to just straight ahead vocal songs. And would you want to do it? And he said, yes. And I said, who would you want to use on drums? And he, the first name that came to mind was Vinnie Apice. So like I said, it just, it came together so easily in terms of the musicians. Yeah. Um, and from there, uh, like I said, Russell Allen had signed up to do Trans-Siberian Orchestra. So I checked him out and went, this has got to be the guy, got him in the fold, and then asked Jeff for his favor to sing backgrounds, and then said, asked him for another favor and said, please sing lead on half. And after I got done layering all my guitars, uh, I still felt like there was room for keyboards. And even though there wasn't a ton of room uh, for him to do all his uh, heroics on it, uh, Derek Sherinian was willing to play on the whole thing, which he did an amazing job of just playing all the right tasteful stuff. And there are a couple solos for him that he tears up, but um, a tip of the cap to Derek because he was kind of overqualified too, in a sense. And Oh, Derek's fantastic. Absolutely he's an amazing fantastic. talent. And I, all these guys are amazing talents and I really owe a lot to them for bringing these songs to life for me. Um, like I said, I tried to avoid within the writing uh, coming from any standpoint of wankage and saying, and then this section we'll, do, we'll you know have a drum break, and then I'll take this two minute solo, and, and then we'll go into seven eight or whatever, or, you know, odd meters, and you know, to get progressive. It's nothing like that. It's really just like these like rock songs that I wrote tastefully played by great players. Yeah, tasteful is the word for it. You get a lot of, or I get sent a lot of sort of guitar hero albums, and you go. Wow, eight minutes solo was that really necessary? And and this this is just you know this is just great rock songs. And uh, just quickly on Vinny, um, back in two thousand thirteen, I did this a world with heroes kiss tribute, and I got a call by a guy, and he said, "Do you want Vinny Apache to do the song Magic Touch for you?" And I was like, "Wait, what? The Vinny playing sort of a disco kiss song?" He's like, "Yeah, I'm in." Um, it's just a he's just a thrill to have Vinny on any project. He's so great. Um, before we mentioned Heavy Montreal, uh, Joel, before we wrap this up, do you mind if we just uh, listen back to a Warrant interview I did at Heavy Montreal with uh, Eric Turner and Robert Mason? No, of course. I love those guys. What a great band. So, of course. Yeah, so uh, I'll just set this up real quick. Uh, back at the beginning of August, uh, you heard me, of course, talk about Heavy Montreal a lot on the podcast. And I had sat down with Eric Turner and Robert Mason backstage. And uh, the tape was recorded on a friend's equipment, and he sent it to me about six weeks later. So I don't want to forget. So here is Robert Mason and Eric Turner at Heavy Montreal. Welcome to another episode of One on One with Mitch LaFon Live at Heavy Montreal. We are here with Warrant, Eric Turner, and Robert Mason. Good day. Good day, mate. It's good to be here. So you've played this festival before, Eric. Tell me about playing this festival and what it's like to come to Montreal. Yeah, it's great to come back. We love Montreal. Beautiful city. Amazing fans. Great food. You know, we love Canada. All from east to west and everything in between. We love Canada. But uh, yeah, it was neat to play here in 2008. Uh, that was the inaugural year. Great event. And it's grown a lot since uh, since 2008, and we're stoked to be back. Hey, plan on checking out any of the bands later tonight? Um, I know Robert will. Now, yeah. Robert, <laughs> throwing it to me. Throwing it to you. 
You've been in the band for what, six, seven years now? Yeah, almost eight, actually. Yeah. Almost eight. Yeah. Listen, you're, you're replacing Janie Lane. That was a great challenge, but you've just been handling it fantastic. Uh, how does it feel for you to be in Warrant? Uh, it's high praise. I appreciate that compliment. Yeah. yeah I mean, well, Lynch Mob opened for Warrant in, uh, yeah. in arenas in the early 90s, so we all got to kind of know each other then. And, you know, I used to, I, Lane and I were friends. Right. I mean, we were truly friends on the road and, and even afterward. So it was a good organic fit, man. They needed a guy, and I'm a guy, you know, and it just kind of came together. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, overcomplicate it. It, it just works. Yeah, it really does. Uh, Rockaholic came out, what, three years ago, two years ago now? Yeah, almost three. Three years. What are the plans for the next one? Uh, to write more songs. It's going to be all different songs than Rockaholic, I swear to God. Concept <laughs> album coming up? No, 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 no. Yeah, the concept will be it. Right. Actually, I'd like to uh, – I kind of have been throwing a bunch of ideas around. I know we all have. I'd like it to be a heavier record. Yeah. And, uh, and just a little more just roots American rock organic and make it like a song. I'm overusing the word organic today. It was probably because of catering. I just right. came from catering. Uh, well, which, by the way, the catering at Heavy which Montreal. Is right. I mean, stellar. Stellar. Right. I've been to, you know, all over the states, Jones Beach, uh, out Long Beach, all this, and it's pizza, chicken tenders, and fries. And here it's duck, lamb, yeah. rabbit burgers. Oh, yeah. The salmon was amazing. I'm going back after the set. Um, other than Warrant, are you planning on doing anything else with any other bands or anything on the outside, solo album, or back to Lynch Mob, or... Uh, back to Lynch Mob, no. Uh, I do some writing. Right. I go to Nashville and write with a bunch of country songwriters just to kind of get better at that craft. And I don't fancy myself Paul McCartney by any means, you know. So you kind of always want to grow, and that gives you a different thing. But this is plenty for me, man. We, we play a lot throughout the year. Uh, we've, we're saddled with the task of writing another record that we want to put out next year. So, man, our hands are full. Uh, Eric, let me just ask you, Warren's been around for many, many years. You, you're, you're, you're in this nice comfort zone, right? You, you sort of just come out every summer and do a few shows, and right? We do, yeah, we do more than a few. We do around <laughs> 50 shows all over the country. And in Canada, nice in Canada it's, it's yeah. a really nice schedule. You know, we, we play just enough to keep us happy, you know, in January, February, March. And then May gets busy, June, July, August, September slammed. October is already pretty slammed. We're having a very busy year and uh, we're having a lot of fun doing doing this. You know, we still love it after all these years, and we're stoked to be able to do it. I mean, look, look where we're at. We're in Montreal. We're getting paid, getting free beer, free food, free wine. playing for thousands of people, free wine. I mean, it's great work if you can get it. Trust Hanging me. out with all the kids. Yeah. All the kids. And I'll just finish with this. Uh, you know, the autobiography seems to be the thing that all the rock stars are doing. Is that something that you're interested in doing at some point, Eric? Um, we've talked about doing it as a band. I, you know, I don't know if anybody would ever do their own. Um, I, my biggest fear about doing an autobiography is just to fall into that whole cliche. I've read a bunch of them, the same old shit. Talk about drugs, you know, sex. Uh, write, write about what you know, Eric. Write about what you it. know. Yeah, I'm not into, <laughs> I'm not into talking about my past, you know, too much. I don't know if it was more music orientated and more about the band and, uh, you know, what we've done musically and touring, and not so much about all the crap everybody already knows. Same old story, different names. I'm saving all my good stories yeah. for a movie. They're, they're for me. When you're 90. Yeah, I'm going to release them all. Right. Freak everybody out when, when I'm, like, in my 90s. Great pleasure, boys. Have a great set today, and uh, I'm going to go catch that. Yeah, man. Thank Please you. Do. Thank Please you. Do. Thank you. Thanks. Great to see you. Thank you. There you have it, folks. That was Robert Mason and Eric Turner of Warrant at Heavy Montreal back in August. A little late to get it to you, I understand, but I had, as I mentioned, taped it on a friend's equipment and uh, was only recently given it. Uh, the tape so there you go uh joel hoekstra is here with me talking about the new album from joel hoekstra's 13 dying to live uh joel you know always a pleasure to talk to you it was uh, a great half hour that we spent going through the white snake stuff and 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 vinnie apathy and dying to live and uh you know um any more plays in the future for you by the way any more uh, rock of ages or anything like that oh i i have no idea i I never really set out to do anything like that, honestly. I think no no kid starts guitar and goes, someday I'm going to play in a Broadway show. 
but it, that ended up being a great opportunity for me. It ran six plus years. There's always talk of bringing it back and there's other productions of it that maybe down the road would make sense for me, but not right now. Um, as I said, yeah, I think I've, I've got a lot on my, my plate in terms of White Snake and then promoting the album and, and seeing what I can do in terms of supporting this album right now. Yeah, you, you've had a, a great, great career and uh, very much uh, looking forward to the release of uh, Dying to Live, which comes out in a couple of weeks and uh, hopefully a tour. Um, where can people find you online? Everybody can just go to my website. I've got a difficult name, though, so I'm going to spell it for you. J-O-E-L-H-O-E-K-S-T-R-A dot com. com, And everybody can link over to all my social media stuff from there. Uh, just speaking of the name, because, you know, it took me a while to learn how to say it. Did did anybody or a manager ever say to you, just call yourself, you know, Joel Ho or Joe Hoke or... or <laughs> I should have done it a long time ago. I think I probably would have gone with my middle name, which is David. But it, it always felt like by the time I thought of it, I always felt like it was too late <laughs> to change it. So I don't know. Yeah, it... I probably should have had a stage name, but then again, I've mentioned it to David and he's like, no, it's great. It's unique and blah, blah, you know? So uh, it's definitely tough though. It's a tough name on people to, to spell and to pronounce. So, but it's all good. I don't take any offense to it being um, mispronounced. And I suppose there's a longevity thing that happens just from being real as a person too. Yeah. And you know what? As far as people pronouncing it, listen, my name is L-A-F-O-N and I get people asking me all the time, is it Lafon? Is it Lafon? Is it Lafon? And it's just like, really? It's, it's that complicated? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, those are not complicated letters. It's not like it's X-Y-Z-Z-P or something. <laughs> And, right <laughs> you know but hey it, it, it is it is it is what it is uh, of course uh, if you want to follow me at twitter it's at mitch lafon you can head over to the facebook page one-on-one -on -one with mitch uh, joel again always a pleasure and uh let's remind folks buy the album please uh don't uh, don't download it or steal it just uh throw out the what is it 10 bucks is it something like that for an album these days i uh, yeah i think 10 bucks come on yeah, you got to have 10 bucks to support your artist. It's it's important to support the artist all the time. Well, right? I'll let you I'll, I'll let you say it, but you're saying it well. Thank you, Mitch. There you go. Thank you, Joel. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much, bro. Cheers.